Hello and welcome to Google Fast Starters. Uh, I'm Neil Perkin, the uh, moderator of Google Fast Starters and also the founder of consultancy business Only Dead Fish. And uh, today we are fortunate to have uh, Ian Fitzpatrick uh, joining us. Uh, so Ian is the Global Director of uh, Brand Strategy and Operations at New Balance. Um, so Ian, would you care to introduce yourself? Sure. Thanks for having me back, Neil. Um, as, as Neil said, Ian Fitzpatrick, I've been with New Balance for three years now after uh, 18 years agency side. So in the in the middle of my first client side gig, certainly a, an eye opening experience. And before that, had my own shop uh, here in Boston called Almighty, uh, previously spent time with Havas early in my career. So have had a, I suppose, a breadth of different kinds of experience and view into the into well, I suppose a range of categories yeah brilliant I don't Thank know you. that's the best introduction of myself <laughs> that's all right no problem um and so uh fast start is obviously we structure it around the five questions um so mm -hmm. we like to sort of believe that fast start is all about the interested and interesting of the industry and uh you certainly like, so the, the five questions are really about the learning uh, through your career uh, and also um, mistakes that you've made and also your predictions around where the industry is going uh, and also uh, our kind of catch-all question at the end, which is what's the question that I, you wished that I'd asked you. So uh, I'm just going to crack straight into the first question, if that's all right. And uh, you've had a really varied career, as you say. So uh, founder at Almighty and then production, I think it was, that you were asked at RSCG and then design at Mattel and then music journalism as well. So, I mean, that's a pretty varied career. So I'd just love to ask across all of that sort of uh, variety. What's the best thing that you've learned? Oh, the best thing I learned was from a client. I don't know how many people are going to answer that question that way. I was really fortunate to have a client maybe a decade ago, a great guy named Mike Sullivan, um, who talked a lot about the ways in which our beliefs shape what we deliver. You know, he, he had worked from a framework that started with this idea that our beliefs inform the tools that we choose and the ways that we organize uh, ourselves, the systems that we put into place and that each of those describes how we work and that how we work ultimately informs what we make. And I think about that framework daily, right? This idea that the distinct beliefs that we hold about the world around us, about consumers, not a word I love, but about, about people in the marketplace, about brands, shape very much the way that we make products or services. And I, I think about that a lot. And I think, I think I was drawn to the place that I am today for those very reasons. Right? I think a lot about how, for example, our brands, our organization's investment in manufacturing and in craftsmanship drives the way we organize for better or for worse and the tools that we use and the systems we put in place and how we do things. And I don't know that, um, I don't know that without that framework, I'd have that same lens for understanding my relationships with the, the products that we make and, and the people we make them for. So the best lesson I had was, uh, was a, a framework rooted not in the mechanics of business or industry, but rather a way to think about the relationships between our values and our output. And I, I think that um, one of the things you've said before now that I recall is about the need to kind of believe deeply in something and uh, and actually to catalog your beliefs. I think you sort of talked before about the need to kind of write it down to just have, have some sort of guiding principles. Tell me a bit more about that. I think I've worked with a lot of people and with a lot of organizations that weren't rooted in a set of beliefs. And that's not to their necessarily to their detriment. For me, I've been fortunate to get to do the thing I've wanted to do since I was a child. I started as early as nine or 10 wanting to, to sell footwear, to work around footwear and apparel. And I think I've been on a path to do this because I knew that that was important to me and I knew that there was a way in which I wanted to do that. There's no part of me that ever fancies the idea of, I don't know, going to work for a furniture brand. 
or going to work in management consulting. Those are fine paths, but they're not, they're not me. I've spent a lot of time to your point, cataloging the things that, that matter to me, writing those down, going back to them, uh, wanting to be around physical products, for example. So many of my colleagues have found their way into FinTech or, um, you know, all manner of, of, of tech driven products. And I love hearing about what they're doing and I'm enamored with uh, the work they're delivering. But for me, there's something really important about a tangible physical product. Listen, the best, the best day I ever had doing what I'm doing, Neil, was up in a factory in Norwich Walk, Maine. It's something that, that New Bounce does for a lot of its associates. Here in the US, we end up in Maine and in, in Britain, they end up in Flimby. Up on the up on the coast uh, in Scotland, and spent a day working the line. And you realize a couple things. First of all, you realize the the absolute magnetism of tangible physical product. You also realize what a phenomenal skill it is to be able to take these materials and move them through a machine with anything like grace or precision. I mean, it's incredibly challenging and and difficult work. And for me, what was magical about that moment wasn't the appreciation of craft, but was the realization that all I ever really wanted to do was work with something that would end up on somebody's body. Uh, it was a really nice moment for me. And I think the belief or the understanding that, that's, that that was who I wanted to be and what I wanted to do, really, really important for me. I think it also shapes the way I think about the work we deliver on the marketing side. Right? It's not just it's not just a matter of valuing brand or valuing craftsmanship. But for me, it's an understanding that to take something that was made by hand with purpose, with all those years of experience, with all the work that's gone into sourcing and 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 growing the materials that go into that. And then to waste that with an offhanded bit of copywriting or to mail in the way that we capture that image is to waste an extraordinary amount of effort. So if you believe, as I think I've come to learn about myself, that there's this extraordinary thing that happens when you touch a really considered physical object, it completely changes the way that you think about the tools, the systems, um, the, the, the structure of an organization that brings that to market. And I think one of the real challenges for modern marketers so often is that we, we operate at such an arm's length from the manufacturing process or the product creation process. It's one of the reasons why right now I want to be back in the office because this is where I touch product. This is where I encounter um, the craft of designing or, or, or shaping those products. So it took me a long time to really understand that about myself and to understand that the, the gravity that a physical product like that would have for me. But a lot of that came from much earlier in my career, spending time thinking about what really matters and what do I really believe in? I mean, it's, it's so interesting the way you're speaking there about the um, about that day that you spent and um, the connection that gave you to the products that you're actually marketing, and um, and and interesting that you're saying here it's not just about appreciating the value of the craftsmanship, but also about the the effort that goes in to actually creating the product itself. Uh, so I guess you you know, do you think this is something that all marketers should really do, just to connect into? the kind of products that they're actually marketing to spend more time understanding how they get produced, how they are manufactured, what goes into all the other side of the business as well. Boy, it's hard to say what all marketers should or shouldn't do. I remember reading once that uh, the, the chef Thomas Keller talking about the idea that to burn a crouton was to waste the effort of the farmer in growing the wheat. Um, and that, that stuck with me, I suppose, now for a few decades. I think anybody working in any space um, benefits, not necessarily should, but benefits from a, from a connection to the physical thing that they're bringing to market. I think it's never been more important in a world where I think we're moving quickly post uh, into a post-fast fashion and reusable and um, 
repairable world that we have those connections to those products. Um, and I think the current state of all manner of things is a byproduct of us being completely distended from the creation of those things. Uh, so I don't know if everybody should, but I know that for me, it was a profound moment. Okay, brilliant. And I'm just going to uh, go back to the, the kind of range of different uh, work that you've done over the years. And mm -hmm. uh, I think you've, you've also talked before about um, taking circuitous routes. I think this was the talk, I think, to some Boston Uni ad students a few years ago. But um, when I looked back at that and you were talking about things like following your geekdom and becoming a thoroughly spiky person, uh, which is just a really interesting kind of um, take on you know, that, that sort of idea of just doing lots of stuff and experiencing stuff to become interested and in interesting. So uh, what is it that you think that gives you? I've, it's phenomenal that you dug in to find those things. Uh, I remember thinking them, but haven't thought about some of those in quite a while. I never took a traditional route to getting here. I'm the guy who's now what, pushing well, 47 and enrolled in an MBA program, um, doing it in reverse, I suppose, at this point. I've, I've always fancied the idea of being an outsider. I spent years, I think, trying to examine the limits of how much you can do from the outside. You, you work perpetually, right, as the outsider in organizations brought in to help frame up an objective outsider perspective. And I think I certainly can relate to that. It's odd now that I've become the insider and trying to figure out how to, become, how to remain an outsider on the inside. But I do think that having a circuitous path here, that spending time writing about pop music for a living or doing you know, research on, on computer games uh, for Mattel, put me in a position of observer, recorder, storyteller, trying to figure out how to explain to somebody a world in uh, their own world, but from an outside perspective. And I think it brings, for me, what it's allowed me to do is to come into an organization like this to the extent that I've been successful, and I don't know that I have, but it allows me to come in with that outsider's perspective and objectively ask questions about our assumptions, about how the world views us, what they know about our products, what they believe. It's really, it's really easy inside an organization like ours or any really product-driven organization that's been around for a long time to begin to buy into an internal worldview of what you represent in the broader culture. And I think it's so critical to maintain that beginner's mind or that outsider perspective that allows you to challenge internal dogma, not to, not to be a about it, right? But, but ultimately to remind ourselves that the things we've internalized haven't largely been internalized by a broader culture. And the way to stay as close to culture as you can is to be able to tap into all of these various and sundry experiences that you have um, that can help sort of paint a world that isn't nearly so focused on your own organization as you tend to believe the world is. Yeah, that's, it's so interesting, isn't it, about um, that sort of beginner's mind piece? Because I think it's easy to just, we forget what lens we look through things sometimes. And I think when you're inside an organization, perhaps you, you become sort of accustomed to certain ways of looking at things, perhaps. And uh, maybe there's a sort of certain dogma or, or beliefs or uh, ways of appreciating things and, and so what you're saying there is about the need to actually just come into everything with that challenge and with that sort of openness, is it? I, I did so. I was really fortunate a few years ago to do some work with Colonel Casey Haskins, um, who's done all manner of great speaking on the modern organization. Uh, he's a professor of strategy at West Point, uh, was former leader of U.S. forces in Afghanistan. Brilliant man. And one of the things he talked a lot about was that the greatest Area, the, the area that can affect the greatest change is inside the organization, but on the periphery, right? That you can't change it from the center, but you have to be on the inside of that organization to be able to drive the kinds of change that you intend. 
so I spend a lot of time thinking about how do I exist within an organization like this, but close enough to the periphery that I can that I can still see the outside world. Um, it's a real challenge for in-house brand strategy people. Yeah, I mean, do, do you think like it's interesting about the the sort of the edges there that you're talking about? Is that is that relevant as well to kind of fresh perspectives, innovation? You know, really just being connected into the outside more. It is. Uh, it's funny. Fresh perspectives aren't by and large, or at least the connection to culture aren't by and large where I've spent my time. Look, the, we're having a really nice moment in the world right now. And a lot of that is because our product teams candidly are living in, a, in, in just wonderful proximity to culture. So an incredible amount of good work happening on the, especially on the lifestyle product side and connecting with great cultural partners, cultural creators. I'm spending more of my time focused on how do we organize around the fundamentals, right? How do we, how do we, how do we bring together really strong, basic practices around the way we allocate resources, right? Our working versus non-working dollars, how we look at media. Because to me, the, the most valuable thing I can do is bring fresh eyes to, to places where there's an opportunity to do the basics really, really well. And I think it's never been truer than in the moment we're in, in all of the, all of the fragility of the, the modern economic climate, it's never been more important to have those fundamentals down and nailed, especially in categories where I think a lot of those, those fundamentals have been disregarded for shiny objects. So um, to answer your, your, your very simple question with a long complicated answer, staying on the periphery isn't about staying, purely about staying close to culture. It's also being able to take a wide view and say, where are, where can we change a few simple things and drive a massive amount of effectiveness? Um, that's the extraordinary opportunity of an organization like this one. Great. Uh, and I just want to um, move this into just thinking, uh, continuing on the learning theme, really, I guess, but um, just think about your, your biggest mistake uh, that you've made in your career and what you learned from that. So tell me about that. There are so many of them, Neil. Um, uh, truthfully, I think, as I sat to think about this question, I think the biggest mistake is that early on in my career, I don't think I adequately understood the downstream effects of bull. I don't have a, a, a nicer way to frame that. You know, listen, when you when you're starting out and you start, you go and you start a firm, as I did in, you know, I was 29 when I started my own place. And one of the real regrets I have is not having built, because of some of those circuitous roots, not having built the foundation that I think I needed to, the foundation of knowledge and understanding of the way that the mechanics of, the, uh, of business work. There was a moment when everybody I knew was starting an agency. I remember in about 2004, you know, we had, you know, Modernista was thriving here in Boston and we had the Barbarian Group you know, stood up around that time. These are all friends. These were, this was our universe. And so, uh, you know, here in Boston, but everywhere I knew, um, my friends, my colleagues were starting firms. And we started by and large by being able to exploit channel opportunities, right? We can go build you a flash website or we can jump in um, on the early ages of social and we can help provide perspectives. And it's very, very easy in those worlds to exploit some channel expertise, but to scale, you have to be able to move beyond those channels. And very, very quickly, the pressure, especially when you're, especially when you're, when you've established a, a partnership with a group of people who have mortgages and families, the pressure to say, yes, we can take that to projects that are candidly beyond your purview, beyond your skill set, beyond your expertise is extraordinary. There's that great scene in Argo where Ben Affleck and Alan Arkin are sitting on the steps and Alan Arkin talks about, you know, Hollywood is like coal mining, you know, you come home and you can't wash it off you at the end of the day. And I feel that way about our category a lot, right? I, I'm 
I have deep and abiding regrets around the number of times I have said we can take on this project or even that we've that I've been party to giving advice that in retrospect wasn't rooted in a working understanding of the business problem because that's how you obtain new clients, new opportunities and scale and grow your business. I don't think I understood at the time the difference between being smart, good at one thing and being <laughs> understanding and good at many things. Um, so I have a lot of regrets about um, being party to that. I think a lot of us were. I think some of the brightest people in our, in our industry, candidly, were and went through a lot of the same things, some very successfully, not so successfully. But the early 2000s uh, through the, the middle of the next decade was wrought with that. And I think a lot of us, when we get together and talk now, I'm, I'm doing it on camera, but a lot of us, when we talk off camera, I think share some of those same regrets and think back on those mistakes in that way. It's funny, and uh, Andy Nen and his um, episode from uh, Lucky Generals, he was actually talking about um, how the um, how they'd actually said no to a, a large client when they just began uh, the agency and how tempting it was to say yes, but actually just didn't feel right. So, so is it kind of like just how it feels that tells you that it's wrong? I think, I don't, I imagine that's different for everyone. And there's a long, there's a long history of individuals and agencies and brands who've made hay on what they've rejected for various reasons or another. And I'm not going to cast aspersions on any of that. For me, it was about, in retrospect, it's about understanding why you're saying yes or why you're saying no. And if you're saying yes because you need this work to keep your firm alive or to scale it or to justify an investment in a new office or to bring on the staff you need to do something else, rather than because I can do this really well, that's the flag. Right? And I think that's a challenge we all face, no matter where we go, client side, agency side. But as I get older and more experienced and understand some of the problems better than I perhaps used to, I really place a premium on understanding, is this something I can do extraordinarily well? Or is this something I'm doing for other reasons? And if it's other reasons, I'm far less inclined to take it on than I used to be. Maturity is understanding when you need to say no for the right reasons. Yeah, I guess just to, to play devil's advocate with that for a minute. I mean, um, just in, in terms of um, sometimes you can say yes to things which are perhaps at the periphery of what you know, or and they, they're, they're really stretching, they feel uncomfortable, but maybe that can take you into a whole different direction that you didn't really realize was there. Uh, so are you in danger of missing out on opportunities because you, you don't think you can do a brilliant job at that? You might be. I think the I think you then, again, it goes back to why would I take it or not take it? If I'm taking it because I believe that, I, that it will stretch me in exciting new ways, that it will challenge me, and that I can bring an outsider perspective to an insider problem in a non-traditional way, that's one thing. If I'm taking this work that's beyond my grasp because I'm using it as a lever to achieve something that, that I otherwise can't do or wouldn't be able to do, that's where I start to get concerned. I don't think it's about playing safe, but I do think it's about an appreciation for the use of other people's resources and the responsible use of those resources. I shudder to think about all the decisions that were made to invest in all manner of experiences in the early 2000s at the cost of reinvestment in much more effective channels yeah absolutely uh, and let's um bring this into marketing and advertising now yep. even more so because i'd love to get your kind of insight mm -hmm. really now into how you think the industry is changing so what's uh, what do you think are the key things the key insights there i tend to be one of those people boy i'm going to be a really boring guest you know i i tend to believe that by and large the fundamentals aren't changing as much as we want to believe they are. Um, 
I think there are changes in how we make or how we execute something, but the fundamentals of marketing and advertising don't, to me, seem to be changing. To say that they're being changed by algorithms and influencers is like saying that music is being changed by synthesizers and drum machines. And who can make advertising is changing and how much it costs to make it is certainly changing. But the fundamental underlying structures of what makes a melody pleasing are largely intact, even if we're acquiring sort of, you know, new tastes as, as scales of things globalize. Um, I think a fundamental change, and this has been written and talked about at length, there's a really low barrier to entry to marketing and advertising roles that come through technical channels, right? And 20 years ago, to my point earlier, it would have been flash development. And now it might be um, influencer strategy, right? There are a lot of people coming into our category who have incredible technical or specific knowledge, but have never been taught the fundamental mechanics of marketing and advertising. And I think that what's really changing is that leaders now need to bring along people who come in with specific technical or channel expertise and help them understand in order to grow those people. I think what's really changed is that leaders have to be able to help reframe problems in a broader context in a way that that speaks to the to to the language um, of this amazing, brilliant, fascinating, wonderful new 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 labor force. Listen, almost none of the people that will hire came through an ad school or have a marketing degree. Mm. And I, I suspect the same is true on the agency side. I, it certainly was when I was last there. And I think it's really easy to be dismissive of the capacities of those teams or the potential of those teams. I view it very, very differently. I view it as the job of the, you know, so many of the, by the way, of the people that you've focused on in Firestarters are people who've now really become gardeners right? Tending to young talent, growing and uh, them and helping them see a, a broader perspective on the kinds of challenges we face. But candidly, uh, an extraordinary number of people here elsewhere uh, work in marketing who have a very, very limited understanding of, the f of even the most basic fundamentals of how media works or even what brands are or how they work. Um, and that's a real challenge. More than more than understanding how to do, how to train a machine, more than understanding how to deal with whatever the latest, you know, with, with Ethereum, it's understanding how to bring people on to a broader sense of what drives growth, sustainable long-term growth. Yeah, I mean, um, I, I recently read um, David Epstein's book, uh, Range. Yep. I don't really read that. Um, <laughs> But it's, it's a fascinating take on on generalists and uh, and the danger of specialising too early, too soon on on one thing. And there's there's an interesting sort of balance here, isn't there, between the value that specialism brings and how that and the, and and then how do you bring that all together? And then how can you experiment in order to become something you know a, a, a emergent out of all of that specialism, which is actually more generalist? Well, how long did we spend talking about T-shaped people? You know, at one point, right? Um, I remember seeing, I, I recall that Ben Melvin wrote just a phenomenal piece years ago on, on developing and nurturing T-shaped people. It's one of those things that now, now that you've, now that I've brought it back up, I'm going to go back and, and revisit. I think the real challenge is not trying to convert specialists to generalists, but rather giving specialists a broad understanding of how their small piece of the world fits into a larger puzzle. Right. It's really, really easy in the modern organization and even easier when we're all remote and distributed right now to to stay within your lane and i suppose as somebody who has taken famously now circuitous routes i'm not a big believer in staying in your lane so to me among the many things we need to ask of leaders now it's to connect those dots for people and to make sure that nobody's operating without a broader context for what's enabled or what barriers exist to the work that they're doing and how that drives and how that drives value. We don't talk enough here and probably anywhere with young talent about 
how the work they do creates value for the organization and for that matter, how value is created within the organization. Yeah, there's an amazing study um, which I came across actually when um, I was writing one of my books. It was um, Adam Grant. I didn't want to come across him, but mm -hmm. um, so so he did a study where he was um, uh, connecting sort of fundraisers for a college, uh, and they were raising money for scholarships. And it was like sure. they had students in a call center, and and he got a scholarship student, you know, somebody who's really had their life changed by um, um, uh, this scholarship that they won. Um, and they came in and talked to the fundraising team. And after they did that, the um, the fundraisers were the, the amount that they were raising increased by about 40 percent just because they were connected in to the impact that they were having um, and the changes that they were making in people's lives. It's a really interesting study. So, I mean, how do you do that in an organization? How do you connect people through to the passion that people have for your product or the, the way in which they're using it, the way in which you know it, it brings value into the world? I think there are a lot of ways to do it. Something we did a lot uh, in 2019, 2020, before the current state of the world, is we put a, a, a significant amount of effort against bringing teams to into retail stores, spending time watching how people shopped, how people held a product, what how they how they scanned a footwear wall, or how they went through an apparel rack. And what we tried to do was to connect them to people who worked in those channels, the ability to work with the running team, to go shop for a running shoe, or the ability to work with you know, the, the lifestyle product team to go you know, sneaker shopping. And when you spend time understanding how, how that product finds somebody who wants to put it on their body, I think it fundamentally forces you to ask, how does the work I do connect to that? I think the other thing that you really have to do is you have to take away, you have to take, you have to strip away the idea of judgment or disdain for what people don't know. You really have to work hard in the modern organization, especially a fast moving, fast changing one. You have to create space for people to say, I don't know, or I don't understand. It's really easy in an organization like ours to float through a whole set of processes or workflows full of acronyms and language you don't understand and realize two years in that you don't have the slightest idea how part of the business works. And I think, I think really strong leaders in a world of people not necessarily schooled in the fundamentals have to create safe spaces for people to say, I'm not sure it's okay for me to admit that I don't know this, but I don't know this. Help me connect the dots. Um, and that's a, that takes a kind of hands-on leadership that we often don't create time for with our leaders or within organizations. Uh, but it's incredibly important to be able to help people either ask you the questions that they can't ask everybody else or to create, put them in a context in which those questions are answered for them. Yeah, I think one, one of the best bosses I ever had actually used to um, just stop in the middle of meetings and just say, what do you mean by that? I don't understand. Or, you know, how does that work? Or mm -hmm. I, what's the, if I use an, an acronym or something, she would just like immediately step in and wasn't afraid to just say that, uh, I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. But do you think one of the uh, one of the interesting things about the flip of that is that if you put the emphasis on learning and the fact that actually we're all in it together to learn as leaders and as staff, whatever, um, do you think that sort of helps the organisation to kind of empower that that sort of uh, humility and culture that it needs to? Humility is one of those one of those tough, hard to wrangle concepts. I think. I think creating a world of curiosity, you know, so many people talk about curiosity and we do, we tend to do it in such an ephemeral and fleeting way. It's become pretty trite in the category to talk about it uh, or in the, at least in the marketing space, it's right up there with empathy in the list of important words that have been sort of destroyed. To to, to foster that kind of curiosity in young talent, you have to be yourself curious and interested in that young talent. You can't simply go through the mechanics of creating a space for it with a you know suggestion box or a question box or a, a full an ask me anything form. Yeah. Listen, most leadership is still done hand to hand.
Um, somebody I've never met, he's probably somebody you know well, but uh, Richard Huntington years ago wrote a phenomenal essay on the qualities of leaders, you know, and he talked, he opened it with the idea that, that leaders are dealers in hope. And boy, I, you know, I have it taped up above my desk. I think about it all the time. It's been a phenomenally important essay in my, in my life. To be a dealer in hope, you have to understand where people are, what their fears are, what their goals are, and you have to be hand-to-hand -hand invested in helping them do that. And that, that takes work almost every day. But it's never, to me, been more important to adopt that mindset in a world where people are coming in with sort of asymmetrical aptitudes. They know a lot about one part of it and not a lot about the other. So how do you de-risk that for them? How do you create a space where you can help turn a specialist into a T-shaped person without forcing them to acknowledge that that's a need? Um, and to me, you know, that's, that's the most hopeful act a, a leader can take on. Um, but it's slow and it's hard and it doesn't show up on your performance reports and it's not very sexy. Um, the older I get, the more I value that kind of work. Excellent. Thank you. Can, can I just, uh, I want to ask for your prediction as well, though, um, as well as talking about um, how the industry is changing, just mm -hmm. where you think it's going. Um, so what would be your key prediction really for uh, where, where, where we're heading? I think we're headed to an interesting confluence in which we have this we have a really fragile world in so many ways, right? And yet we're increasingly relying on machines trained in a past version of events that I'm not certain are predictive of future events. Now, none of that is, I don't have any real antipathy towards, towards AI or machine learning or an algorithm or an algorithmic future. All of those things are fine. But I am really aware that we're entering this age that's going to be tough to reconcile with older tools used for planning. And that the cycles that we're planning for and building around are getting shorter. I think you wrote a piece years ago about the tyranny of the annual budget planning cycle, right? Uh, see, I, I promise you, I, I do read those things. And you know, here we are in this world in which global supply chains make the idea of planning for 12 months out right now an utter impossibility. Yeah. Candidly, I'm not sure that I could plan 90 days out with any bit of effectiveness. And so the prediction for the future of planning and marketing, if there is one, is that we're going to, these cycles are going to get necessarily shorter in the fragile space that we're operating in. And we're, we're fragile I think economically, fragile operationally and logistically, and I would say fragile culturally, right? Long-term planning precludes um, incorporating the idea of culture that shifts, changes much more quickly than it ever has. We're not we're not set up to budget for the disruption that's going to come in any number of channels in the next 90 days, six months, year. So I think we're going to have to figure out how to reconcile machines trained on a past version of events with a future that doesn't quite look so very much like those past events. And we're going to have to figure out how this, how to reconcile this, um, this algorithm plus individual plus person thing really works. Um, those are the things that are, I think are, are top of mind. I worry that whether we're talking about um, you know, resource planning, we're talking about budgeting, we're talking about line planning, that we're talking about um, media and marketing plans, I worry that I worry that we're building for a stability that, that isn't quite there and isn't going to be there for three, four, five, maybe 10 years. Yeah, I mean, you talked earlier on about um, how the fundamentals of good marketing really still exist and, and are still very true. But that sort of cycle is getting shorter. What do you think that means to marketing process, the practice of marketing? 
<laughs> I think there's going to be a real challenge for brand marketers who are creating assets, content, media vehicles that necessarily are going to, how to phrase it, that may exhaust their role in culture before they exhaust their audience. All right. That, that it will be impossible or fair, not impossible, but very challenging to create things that still carry an intended cultural meaning 90 days from now, but need 180 in order to reach the, you know, the GRPs that they need to do to do their job. So all of a sudden you're going to, the, the, the very different speeds at which culture and media are moving is going to create a real challenge to build things that are enduring without being too of the immediate, without being, sorry, without being so abstract that they never carry any meaning whatsoever. Hmm. Um, I think the other challenge, we're in a really, I'm not sure I articulated all that well. The, the other challenge I think we're in is we're in, a, for a brand like ours, we're in a world where, where product marketing is going to be the, the, the relative roles of product and, uh, and brand marketing in a world where product availability and supply chains are very, very fragile is I think going to lead to some really interesting moments over the next few years where brands with a long tradition of product marketing are going to have to start working further up in the funnel and telling brand and category level stories in ways that are going to build new kinds of muscles for them. Um, because whether we're talking about retailers or, or, or manufacturers, the ability to predict or to, to, to assure an, a, an audience that a product will even be available in market is going to be a staggering challenge. Um, so I think to answer, uh, I didn't answer that very well, but to answer your question, I think we're looking at a world in which the relative roles of product and brand marketing are about to shift in profound ways. And that that's going to require an awful lot of good product marketers to build some very new muscles. Yeah, and it's I mean, um, the whole area of product marketing, I think, is is really fascinating right now because the the kind of bringing together of um, if you think about it in a digital sense and product management and that kind of role bring, coming together with marketing and that kind of intersection is really quite interesting because it just it enables you to kind of really think about um, some of the characteristics of what you would, how you would um, manage a product and how you would iterate a product and then baking marketing into a product. You know, it's a very different way of thinking about marketing in many ways, isn't it? I think it is. I think the other real challenge is that, is that a world of, in our category, um, outside of the obvious players, a world of historically wholesale brands have now had to shift to a direct-to-consumer model in a very, very, very brief window of time. And that's happening in conjunction with a shift from being able to reliably drive product marketing to driving brand marketing. The dynamic of those two things happening at the same time is fascinating. The other thing that that's forced is that for an organization like ours, which historically has been a wholesaler um, or has dealt with wholesale markets, has been that we have to not only get make that pivot from wholesaler to direct to consumer, but also from regional to global at the same time. And I think that you're going to see an extraordinary bit of change in organizations like ours as a result of that, having to get far more global in who we bring into the organization, how not only how products are made, but how campaigns that build those products and connect them to new markets are made and a much a much more nuanced understanding of the, the complex contours of direct to consumer globally. I think, I think brands, so many brands still have a very American or Western European view of, of what direct to consumer looks like, feels like how, and how that experience is shaped. So you've got all three of those dynamics happening at the same time. I think it's going to be a fascinating um, 36, 48 months as organizations wrestle with those simultaneously. 
Amazing. Well, we're almost out of time, but I must ask you our last question, uh, if I may, Ian, which is, of course, uh, what's the question that I'd, uh, you wish that I'd asked you, and uh, what was your answer to that? Well, the question I expected you to ask me was, you know, I think we first met when I did Firestarters back in 2016 on the topic of the, the agency OS, right? And I expected you to ask me if my perspective on that topic has shifted now that I'm client side. I get asked that all the time. Uh, now that I've gone client side. And the answer, of course, is that it's evolved a lot, right? So when I started client side after, again, after a decade working on this brand on the outside, I was really struck by, candidly, how little I understood about how the organization actually works, what really drives margin, the dynamics of the category. And again, mm -hmm. I'd worked in footwear and apparel and this brand for a decade. And my view on the agency client relationship has evolved because I, I've come to believe that one of the dynamics that really has to shift in this space is the extent to which agencies and clients can invest in a true understanding of the business. How do we make that functionally possible? And, which is not to say that our agency partners don't have a strong understanding of the business, but they have a, they have a necessarily incomplete understanding of the business. And it, that fundamentally impacts the way in which they are valued, right? And I think that's an enormous problem in the category. I think it's gonna take a new approach to investment. How does the, how do both the agency and the client make it cost how do we make it affordable for an agency to truly ramp up and continue to learn about that business as that business speeds forward, right? It's going to shift. That's especially challenging in a world where so many relationships are predicated on project, on project engagements, where there's just absolutely no budget for you to truly understand my business. There's in a bid process only enough for you to attack a particular problem, often without the context of why that problem is important to me beyond the obvious. It's going to take a broader investment on the client side in bringing together partners who aren't in marketing to help ramp up our agency partners. Listen, it should be incredibly expensive to work with a great agency. And it should be incredibly valuable to spend that kind of money. I think we've allowed it to become We've, in the category, we've allowed good account management, project management, and strategy to become um, to become fees that clients don't want to pay for or expect to be absorbed by the agency. And I think that dynamic, I think that's got to shift, and it's got to be done in an ongoing way. One of the things I worry about the most, Neil, is that our business is changing, making decisions, pivoting way too quickly for me to even think about appropriately conveying all the implications to our partners. And when that happens, it ultimately becomes arduous to bring them along, not valuable to bring them along. And I worry about that all the time. And we've got some terrific agency uh, partners here who are doing their best. And I think a, a really a, quite a good job to stick tight to us as we make a lot of changes. But, you know, you're working every day with businesses going through extraordinary transformation. And it's incredibly expensive and incredibly complicated to keep your partners tethered to you as you undergo those kinds of transformations. And I think that, that one of the things we have to reconcile as an industry is how do we make that cost effective for both parties? Because at a certain point, your value is your ability to understand my business and connect it to the broader culture. And if we can't if we can't make that first part affordable, then we're making it a commodity, and that's where I get really really scared. So um, certainly, was expecting you to ask me about that, um, and something that that is that is top of mind for me now almost every single day. Amazing, um, Ian. I'd love to talk to you for much longer, but um, unfortunately, we've run out of time. Um, but that has been truly fascinating. And mm -hmm. uh, thanks again for being a guest on uh, Firestarters. Uh, just really great to have you on. Absolutely. Thank you for having me back. Thank you.